There's a poem by Robert Frost called Mending Walls. It's about a man and his neighbour who keep discovering holes in the wall that separates their land. No one has seen them being made or heard them being made, but in spring mending time we find them there again. I let my neighbour know beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go. The poem's kind of tinged with sadness because the man doesn't quite understand why his neighbour keeps wanting to rebuild this wall. He's not quite sure what purpose it serves. My apple trees will not cross over and eat the cones from under his pine, I say to him. He only says, good fences make good neighbours. Good fences make good neighbours. I guess there's something in that, isn't there? There's kind of a sense of security and comfort and order that comes from having a degree of separation from the world out there. We like people close, but not too close. We like having a place where we kind of have control over who gets access. And if there's anything that's compounded that, it's months of a national lockdown. I don't know about you, but there have been parts of this, parts of being locked in and in my own bubble that's been kind of a relief to me. I've just been able to spend time in my little newly wedded bubble with my new husband. And whilst there are so many things I've missed out on and people I wish I could have seen, there's also plenty of places I haven't had to go to and people I haven't had to see, which frankly comes as a relief. I mean, this year, none of us will have to press our way through hordes and hordes of Christmas shoppers invading our personal space. We have a perfect excuse to keep them at a distance. We don't have to make small talk with strangers anymore. We don't have to speak to people who we find uncomfortable or difficult. We don't have to invite them around our houses or feel we need to go up to them and speak to them. We can steer clear of the oddball parent on the touchline who always makes a beeline to talk to us. A polite wave will do. It's in the interest of safety after all. So whilst there are plenty of people I've missed, I also reluctantly have to admit there are plenty of people I haven't missed. It's a relief to me that I now get to control who I interact with in pretty much every space I'm in. Whether it's going to church online or whether it's the way I socialise or the way I shop. I can be completely selective over who has access to me and I can keep at a safe distance from the difficult people and the burdensome people and the awkward people. Maybe for some of us this Christmas will be more peaceful than ever before. Because maybe there's that person that we always have to invite round for dinner but we're actually just relieved that finally we have an excuse not to. That we won't have to have that dinner time conversation where we have to bite our tongue while they criticise our children or criticise our gravy. You m maybe when we say in this series, this Christmas won't be like last Christmas, you're thinking, thank God, because I can't sit through another one of those dinner times. Maybe you are intensely relieved that you can have the order and the calm that you want around your Christmas dinner table this year because you can select out the most difficult people. As the man in Robert Frost's poem reflects on this strange custom that he and his neighbour have built up of setting this wall between them, he, he says this, before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out. And that really struck me because right now I know that I'm trying to wall out COVID-19. The bubble has a purpose. But I guess there are other things that I'm also relieved I'm walling out of my life at the moment, specifically people, types of people I find difficult, interactions I don't enjoy. And I wonder, will it be as easy for us to take down that wall, to come out of that bubble? Yes, we'll be desperate to throw our arms around the people we've missed and the people we cherish. But how easy will we find it to come out of our bubble and interact with the people that we just frankly haven't missed? You know, the fascinating thing about the earliest groups of followers of Jesus was that they lived in a world full of bubbles. Not COVID bubbles, but ethnic bubbles, bubbles based on social standing and where you lived and <clears throat> who your parents were. Everybody who started following Jesus in the first century had grown up in some kind of bubble. But the unique thing about the church for its time 
was the fact that it brought people together from different bubbles, from bubbles that should never normally have mixed. And we hear about one such group which is formed of people from different bubbles in a letter called Ephesians, written to a church, a group of Jesus followers in Ephesus by a guy called Paul. And this group of Jesus followers was made up of people from both a Jewish background and a Gentile background, that's the Jewish word for non-Jews. And Jews and Gentiles were two bubbles that had a history of tension between one another. They just didn't mix if they didn't need to. To be Jewish meant worshipping one God, the God of Israel, to keep yourself separate from the rest of the world, to be holy, to be a set apart nation, to live a different kind of life. And that meant limiting your interaction with those outside the Jewish community, with non-Jews. And frankly, the Gentiles, the Romans, just thought of the Jewish community as odd. They thought of themselves as different, they looked different, they acted differently, they only had one God, and they thought they were special. And no one likes people who think that they're special. And so these two bubbles had a history of tension. The best way to keep peace between them was to keep them separate. They knew that good fences make good neighbours, and whilst they lived in the same cities and the same towns, they lived separate lives. But suddenly members from the Jewish community and non-Jews, Gentiles, were pouring into the same community, into the church, and it was creating problems, just as you and I would expect from two groups who had historically been taught to stay apart from one another and maybe even fear one another. And Paul, who originally established this community in Ephesus, writes to them to try and deal with some of the issues that they're facing because of the historical barriers between their communities. And what I find so interesting about what he writes is that he doesn't offer the advice I would expect him to offer. He doesn't say, well, the wise thing to do would be to put up boundaries between the two of you. The, the smart thing to do would be to just keep at a safe distance. If you let them get on with what they do and, and you get on with what you do, if, if you just kind of tolerate their difference from afar, from a safe distance, then you'll have a more peaceful community and you'll get on fine. But instead, Paul chooses to remind them why they're in community together in the first place, why it's better for them to stick together than to split off into different directions again, why it's better for them not to live with separation between them. I love what he says. He writes to them, for Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, the Saviour, is our peace, who has made the two groups one. In other words, who has made Jews and Gentiles one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Some commentators on this passage think that Paul is referencing an actual physical wall that surrounded the temple in Jerusalem where the Jewish people worshipped. A 1.5 metre high wall that on it had inscriptions basically proclaiming death to Gentiles. Don't cross over this barrier. You don't belong here. You better keep out. But whether he's referencing that physical wall or whether he's just talking about the thing that you and I experience, which is the distance and the separation and the division that exists between communities that don't like each other and aren't like each other. He says Christ has somehow destroyed that barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. And he goes on. For his purpose, he says, was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two and in his body to reconcile them both to God through his death on the cross. In other words, Paul is saying, I know that the wall between you and the division between you used to exist for a reason, but Christ has destroyed that reason. His purpose was to create a new humanity, one that isn't separated by they're the chosen people of God and they're not. He was creating in himself one new humanity. The walls between you no longer serve a purpose. And he has brought both of you to God, to be children of God, making one out of the two, making peace where there was division. The wall's purpose is to separate and create distance. But Jesus's purpose was to join together, to join together different groups of people and to join together people with God. You used to live with walls 
between one another to keep the peace. But now peace has been created by those walls being taken down. And Paul goes on to explain how this works. And he quotes a passage from Isaiah, a prophet who wrote hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. But he quotes Isaiah to explain the way in which Jesus has brought about this peace that he's talking about. He says, he came and preached peace to those who were far away and to those who were near, those who were far away from God and to those who were near to God. For through him, we both have access to the Father through the Spirit. Jesus was born in a bubble of his own. He was born as a Jewish boy in a Jewish family, in a Jewish town, grew up around Jewish people. He had Jewish followers. He preached from the Jewish texts. He preached about the Jewish God. Some people revered him as the Jewish Messiah, come to save the Jewish people from Roman rule. But every now and then there were these hints that Jesus was moving outside of his bubble in the way that he interacted with outsiders, with Gentiles, in the way that he approached disabled people, the poorest of the poor, women with bad reputations. People quickly realized if they spent time with Jesus that he was a lot more interested in tearing down walls than he was in building them up. And actually it was partially this about Jesus and how much it flew in the face of his culture at the time that fueled the fire that would eventually lead to his arrest and his trial and his execution. He just wouldn't stay within his bubble. You know, there's this beautiful scene in the nativity story, which is an adaptation of the Christmas story that came out a few years ago. And these unruly and dirty shepherds come to see the baby Jesus. And as they enter the cave where Mary and Joseph and Jesus are, they hesitate to come closer to him. They, they think they'd better keep their distance from him because that's what they've always been told they should do. You don't come near folk like us. But Mary looks up to the shepherd at the front and she smiles and she says, he is for all mankind. And it's the thing that people noticed was different about Jesus all the way through his ministry. And it's the thing he demonstrated through his life, through his death, and ultimately through his resurrection. That God was doing something new in the world for all mankind. And Paul is desperate for his community to see this great purpose, that Jesus was working to create one new humanity. No longer a chosen Jewish nation and the rest of the world, but a new humanity born of the Spirit of God, made to be children of God, reconciled to God. And in this way, Paul says, making peace. A new kind of peace, not born out of keeping a safe distance, but born out of receiving the gift of God, his son sent to the world. Look, <laughs> the kind of peace that Jesus brought and Jesus taught was more like taking a sledgehammer to a wall than it was like building them. I don't know if you can bring yourself to believe this about God, but God is not a wall builder. He's a wall wrecker. If you try to put one stone in the way between you and God, he would have thrown it away before you even had a chance to lay another on top of it. So for the follower of Jesus, Peace doesn't look like living at a safe distance. It doesn't look like building walls to maintain the calm. It is the realization that Jesus has removed the barrier between people and God. And in doing so, removed the barrier between the children of God. There's just no purpose to separation anymore. Now, here's what Paul was emphatic about, not just in this letter, but in all of his letters about men and women, about the rich and the poor, about Jews and Gentiles, about all sorts of people. In the church, there is no place for walls of separation, especially not for walls of hostility. Our community should demonstrate to the world that Christ has made us one by reconciling us both to God in his body nothing less than that. The church is created to be a picture of good neighbors with no fences. But how often do we experience the exact opposite? A church full of niches and cliques and groups that we just can't seem to wrestle our way into. Maybe that's your experience. Maybe you feel like you're on the outside looking in. But what you really need to know is what it means when a follower of Jesus says that Christ is our peace. 
it means that Jesus is the ultimate wall wrecker. He has torn down the wall between me and God. He has torn down the wall between me and others. And I have no business putting up walls where God has said none need to exist. It seems easier. Maybe it even seems more in the interests of peace for us to live with a degree of separation between ourselves and particularly the people who we find most difficult. To continue to live at a safe distance from the people we wouldn't pick to be in our bubble. Humanity is like the neighbour in Robert Frost's poem who just keeps wanting to rebuild that wall even if they can't really find a purpose for doing so. I'm kind of picking up that the phrase we're all starting to use now is about rebuilding and building back better as Boris Johnson started to say. We're all asking how will we rebuild post-Covid but I'm wondering if the question that I need to be asking and the question we should be asking is how will we tear down? How will we tear down the walls that we have constructed during COVID? Not just the safety bubbles that have prevented us from spreading a disease, but the degrees of separation we have put between ourselves and the world, particularly the people that we wouldn't choose to mix with. And I don't actually think we need to wait until the world opens back up again to begin answering that question, to, to begin saying how will we tear down and to start doing it. It might be as simple as who you choose to pick the phone up to call this Christmas, to check in on and see how they're doing. It might be asking this question in your small group. How have we put a wall around this group? How have I individually put a wall around myself? It might be asking the question in your family. It might be asking the question with your teenagers and your children. Where are we putting walls up between ourselves and the world and how will we break them down? Maybe some of the practical things you will be limited in at the moment, but I'm willing to bet that if we start asking this question, something in us will change in the way that we look at the world around us and in the way that we think about the people outside our bubble. Let me finish with how Frost ends his poem. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. I could say elves, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand, he moves in darkness as it seems to me, not of woods or the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying, for he likes to know it so well. Good fences make good neighbours. Don't let your story end like that. You know, there is someone who doesn't love a wall, who wants it down. It's your saviour the Prince of Peace, here he comes, hammer in hand, and he holds it out to you. Will you be a wall breaker with me, he says. Where have you built up walls? Where have you allowed walls to be formed? Around yourself, around your family, around your tight, selected community. You know you're called to be a wall breaker in your own life, in the world, in the church, with your family. So go on, follow in the footsteps of your heavenly father who wouldn't let anyone lay a single stone between you and him. Tear down the walls. <laughs>